we have Michael Krieger of the Liberty Blitzkrieg with us today. Uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Drew. Drew, it's very exciting to be on with you. I'm very, very much looking forward to our conversation. So uh, my first question that I, I like to ask all of our guests, it's, you know, a little, a little funny, but who are you and uh, what is the Liberty Blitzkrieg? Sure. Um, so obviously my name is Michael Krieger. Um, my background is I, I, my career started at the now defunct Lehman Brothers back in 2000. Um, I joined there right at the top of uh, one of one of our last bubbles, um, the, that tech bubble. And, um, I was, I entered into the program as a oil analyst. So I worked for the guy who covered the major oils and refining companies. So names like Exxon Mobil, Chevron, Texaco, Tesoro, Valero, um, names like that. So I was basically in a cube for five, uh, for five years, uh, going through a, you know, like 10 K's and spreadsheets. And it was, yeah, it didn't, didn't, it wasn't exactly my idea of fun, but I learned a lot. I, my, the analyst that I worked under was extremely smart and, and talented in what he, in what he does. So, um, after that in 2005 ish, I joined Sanford Bernstein, um, as a commodities desk analyst. So this is where I really, I like to describe this as the job that, um, fit my personality perfectly. Uh, I sat on a trading floor. I was looking at all, you know, I was looking at all commodities as well as the energy equities, utility equities, all all that stuff, plus just markets in general. So that there I was able to learn trading and um, you know sort of how markets work and really and really expand out into the, you know more macro everything. Um, and it was at that desk when the financial crisis hit. And at that point I started asking questions as I think a lot of people started asking questions. And um, I started to discover um, that the system wasn't actually set up the way that I had assumed it was set up. You know, I, to that prior to that point, I thought that um, you know th- that I was I was making all this money. I was having such a such a good career because I was great. You know, I was so smart and all that. But then I really realized with the crisis when they started bailing out people like me, um, Wall Street people that didn't need bailouts, I realized how, how gross and rigged the system was. And I really, and I really had a a problem and a difficulty sitting in that chair. Um, so I I started writing about these things, you know, from my seat at Bernstein and then eventually, you know, I really couldn't, couldn't be there anymore. It didn't make sense. I wasn't feeling good about, about the job. And I left in early 2010 and I really had no idea what I was going to do. I uh, started, I continued to write because my job at Bernstein was to write about macro issues. And I had a very, very large you know, client list from of, of the biggest institutional investors in the world, hedge funds, mutual funds, everybody globally. Um, so I kept that going. And then, you know, one day, one of my articles got picked up on, on Zero Hedge. Um, then I had <laughs> RIP from Twitter, the absolute top, incredible, pretty much the absolute top. Um, but, uh, but they, so they picked it up and then I got a bigger audience and then I was interviewed by like Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert of the Kaiser report, if you're familiar with that show and they're brilliant. And, uh, so I sort of, so, so I realized, you know, at this, at this point, you know, okay, well, um, there's an audience for this sort of thing. I think I have stuff to share. Um, and so about a year, year and a half after that in 2012, I decided to just put it in my own blog. Cause prior to that, I was just emailing it out to people, emailing my thoughts out. And I did that then same year as that I discovered Bitcoin and started getting involved in Bitcoin. And that changed my life in a whole nother different way. Um, but basically, uh, for the last base for, for essentially for the last 10 years now, I've been writing about and trying to teach, um, based on my experience and my knowledge and my macro sort of, um, intuition and abilities, you know, what's really going on, you know, you know, how do, how do things work at a, at the biggest picture level? Um, what does that mean? And the interesting thing about today is, is, you know, so many of the themes that I've been writing about for 10 years are, are all really coming to a head because of this pin, right? This pin that, that, that found its way into the balloon, um, of this giant everything bubble. And so it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty incredible time to be talking about all this stuff because it's, it's sort of like the culmination of my last 10 years work, um, coming to a head right now. Yeah. I mean, when I reached out to you a few weeks ago, I I didn't think that we would be sitting here today amidst, you know, a a actual meltdown and this week, you know, two (laughs) trading halts and it's unbelievable. But originally we were going to talk about your piece, financial feudalism, and, and you kicked it off with a, a Frederick uh, Bastiat quote, excuse me, uh, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men in society, 
Over the course of time, they create for themselves a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. And I think that informs uh, our conversation today with you know everything moving so fast. We're actually going to talk about your latest piece, which is called The Shaky Foundation. And so um, what we've seen is coronavirus is exposing a lot of the weaknesses, I would say, in our you know financial, political, and public health systems. Um, but before we get into that, I want to ask, why did you call it a shaky foundation? Uh, can you explain that and, and maybe introduce the, uh, the Jimi Hendrix quote that you used to kick it off? <laughs> right. So, yeah, castles made of sand fall into the sea eventually. I mean, that, that's, that, that pretty much describes how I see um, our civilization uh, at this point. You know? and, and I do think, and I've been saying this for a while, I think we need to rebuild um, the entire civilization in a lot of ways. But we can do that. Um, it's necessary to do that, and, and we should do that. And so I think you know, there is an optimistic um, way, to, to, way to see all of this. But, but, the, but the bigger point is, look, a lot of the, the shaky foundation that we're living in um, started way before I was even born. You know, in the early 70s, as you know, 1971, getting off the gold standard, that really kicked off financialization in earnest, right? So what I like to talk about is after World War II, obviously the United States became a global empire, but that but that empire was based on not a shaky foundation. It was it was based on being you know having the world's manufacturing base after everyone was bombed out, um, playing a part in winning the war and being un- relatively unscathed, um, and then all of the things that the United States already has, like it's blessed with um, naturally, and so that you know lasted for a few decades, let's say two and a half decades. Um, the U.S. was let's say an industrial empire. Empire, a military yeah. empire, but also an industrial empire. It was based on making things. It was based on a real, actual economy and actual economic strength. Starting in 1971, we just started taking the easy way out to empire, and I, I call it. This is the beginning of the financial empire, and that's what we live in now. We're, we're not. We're not an industrial empire anymore. Clearly, right? Like coronavirus is exposing that. For example, we uh, 90. We shipped 95 percent of our mask making capacity out of the United States. Can't even make masks that we need. You know, we're reliant on other countries to provide masks for us. That was would never have been the case um, after right after World War II. We're we're just a different country. So so what is a financial empire? A financial empire is one in, that's really basically controls the world or has controlled the world via the financial system itself, right? But via the fiat U.S. dollar and control of that financial system, which is based on the U.S. dollar. And this made us very, very lazy and very, very weak. Because if all you have to do is run the financial system with this imaginary currency that you can create and use as a weapon at will, you don't, you get into the, you get to the point where you don't need to actually do anything, right? Like a lot of people talk about the military bases and all this, but, but all of that can go away very quickly. If the, if the dollar is not there, the dollar is what, what actually underpins people like to say, oh, well, the dollar is backed up by the military. I actually disagree with that. I think the military is backed up by the dollar and the financial system. If the dollar didn't have the position that it had, or it has, or We'll see how long it lasts. But if, if it didn't have that, then the military wouldn't be able to function everywhere in the way that it does, right, with basically an unlimited budget. So that's where, you know, so that's what we created. So we created and, – and what that's done is it hollowed out the country because we, we all got lazy, essentially. And elites just started saying, well, we don't need manufacturing. We, we just have the dollar. We have the financial system. We have finance, you know, financialization. So they shift jobs overseas, um, increasingly uh, making money just on scams, lever- using a lot of leverage and buying assets um, and, and, you know, buying back shares. I mean, you, you, you discuss, you know, on Real Vision, this sort of thing. It's a, it's a huge laundry list. But the point is, a financial empire that's based on something so uh, shaky um, as a fiat currency that dominates um, is one that at some point will obviously collapse. But but it's interesting that it's taken so long. And what that means is that there's so much more rot underneath that, than people can even imagine. And so if, if you know, if people want to look back, I've been writing, you know, for like I said, since on my website for since 2012, I've been writing about all of the different points of weakness for all that time. And, there, and it's basically every industry. I mean, every, we've hollowed out and put the most corrupt people in charge of virtually everything in the society. Yeah. So, I mean, you talk about corruption and hollowing out and, and kind of covering up that rot that you describe, right? Um, 
what, what was the the effect of 2008 in that? Because that was a huge crisis, and it seems you know very similar to what's happening right now in financial markets. Uh, wh- what was the result of that? Well, why is it allowed to get to this point? Yeah, you know, it was very frustrating for me as I as I described earlier. I, I tell the story sometimes. I remember when TARP uh, when TARP didn't pass the first time. Right. And then they, re, you know, they, they made they made Congress vote again so they could pass it. I, I was I couldn't sleep. And I got into the office very early that morning. And I, I was there was like five people there. But the head, of, you know, the head of trading was there. And I was just I was I stood up and I was just ranting. I was like, this is it. You know, we're never we're never coming back, you know, from this as, as the same country again. It'll never, ever be the same. But and my, and my boss was like, Mike, sit down, take a walk around the block or take a walk around the block. So I just sat down. But I'll never forget that moment because it was very clear to me that there was this there was this opportunity. OK, there was an opportunity to really say, OK, um, there are systemic problems here. You know, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't just try. We should take this as a as a as a lesson and we shouldn't just try to patch it all back together and pretend nothing's wrong. This is cl- there's clearly things that are very wrong. And so, you know, the response was uh, and you see it in the data since to to help people that needed help the least to, to, you know, all the people involved heading up these financial companies, you know, whether they went bust like Lehman or not, they all they all came out of it extraordinarily wealthy, not in jail. That was the lesson. OK, that was one of the big lessons. So any sort of criminal, right, any sort of criminal worth their weight is going to look at that and say corporate criminal, white collar criminal is going to say, oh, you know, it's, it's open season now. You know, there, there, we're, nothing's going to ever happen to us. So let's just go for it. And, you know, Epstein, <laughs> it's not it is, it is another example of it. You know, now Weinstein's finally in jail. But the point is um, elite criminals, basically, I call them super predators because they're the most dangerous basically took that as a signal that, okay, well, there's nothing that we can do that'll put us in jail. There's nothing that we can do. So they just, so the, so the last 10 years just became this gigantic looting spree. And I was very frustrated at the time by the reaction from a lot of people. I know a lot of people were upset, but what I now realize is we were facing a generational uh, crisis at the time uh, that we just weren't prepared to sort of have a reaction to. Because, you know, if you're if you're a, a younger millennial or if you're like a middle middle millennial, you were too young then, you know, to realize. Like, so in other words, the generation, that millennial generation that was about to get shafted and turned into debt slaves for forever, <laughs> essentially, it looks like um, they were too young to, to understand and appreciate what was happening to them. Some of them were still in high school. Um, you know, others were maybe starting into the workforce, but they didn't understand the extent to which that they were getting scammed. And uh, now they do. So it's going to be interesting to see the response um, of that generation that has been so shafted going forward. But um, but that but that was that was, I think, a, a big part of the problem. You know, the, the people that were going to be hurt the most generationally were just too young to know what was going on. Yeah. So, um I, I kind of want to move a little bit forward and, and, and bring this into the coronavirus context, right? So on, on January, I think it was 27th, you tweeted out, one thing I've learned from this coronavirus response thus far is institutions will never do the right thing fast enough in a situation like this to prevent a global disaster when that day arrives. And I, I don't know, I think we're there. That was a month or so ago. And uh, why have public institutions been so late and inadequate with their response to this? Yeah, because again, because um, what we've done in the last ten years, in particular, is created is created this environment that is so um, it's like the opposite of anti fragile, right? I mean, it's it's super fragile. You know, it's it's been coddled so much. Like any downtick in the markets, you have to save the markets. Any any problems, right? Immediate band aid has to be put on rather than reckoning. So so world leaders have created this. Extra, it's like this 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 delicate flower that the the slightest thing can knock it over, but anything big is going to completely pummel it. Um, and something like a global pandemic is like the black swan of all black swans. For something like this, because there's no there's no nobody actually considered it. So I think what was going on from a leadership point of view is this complete inability to reckon with something this big because they knew that they couldn't handle something this big. Right? They, they know that the system can't handle something this big. So instead of actually thinking that it could be this big, they just decided to put their heads in the sand. 
because it was too scary to contemplate. Um, and you and you saw that right off the beginning. I mean, you didn't have to be a genius to look at China building hospitals in four days to know there's a problem. Okay, at that point, we didn't know um, how far it would spread or anything, but you knew there was a major problem in China. And you had to assume that since flights were still leaving China, that it was going to spread. So when I saw, you know, what, what, what really tipped me off other than the fact that China was building hospitals overnight, was the fact that these global leaders were were just downplaying it so much, um, and and this is a, it's 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 sort of like one of those little signals, okay? Because you know um, they they tend to hype things up, right? Fear when it's to their advantage. So if so if you know like after nine eleven, I mean the fear mongering just went off the charts, you know. I mean it was just it was it was clearly just like be be as afraid as possible and then they pass things like the Patriot Act and other things, you know, other stuff like that that we've been living with ever since. Our civil liberties have been essentially destroyed in a lot of ways in this country. Um thanks to 9/11. So when there's a crisis and I don't immediately see you know the the world leaders or establishment or status quo trying to make you afraid um, to do, to, to take away more of your rights that just sent off an alarm bell to me that, that, that to me was just like, okay, they don't, they really don't get this at all. And they're just not dealing with it. So that's how I knew. Um, and you just have to assume, uh, that the leadership today across the world, because of how, let's say easy it's been. Okay. Particularly in the U S uh, have no ability to manage any sort of a crisis scenario. They 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 don't know it. They don't know anything like it, and they're not going to be able to do it. And that's what you're seeing right now. You know, you cannot you cannot trust authority to. to you can't trust what they say at all. Period. End of story. Like just don't. And I and I hope that's a lesson for people out of this. You know, to to think for yourself, to to analyze the facts, and use your own intuition because no one's coming to save you. Right. Politician is not going to come save you. The government is not going to come save you when you need it. They're not saving you. And by the way, they didn't save you in 2008 and 2009 either. Like I like as I like to explain. Right. You, you wouldn't have Donald Trump elected. You wouldn't have had the upsurge in Bernie Sanders. Right. It's a youth youth led political movement if things were just so great after that. The crisis. Right? I mean, we're still dealing with the consequences of that. So do you think the reason that there was no real reform after 2008 was just to kind of kick the can down the road and it's made everything, you know, this situation maybe worse than it was? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, the, we, we would we would because it's it's a combination of reasons. First, the one reason which I just which I describe is because. If you're just going to make another castle of sand on a, on the old castle of sand, you're going to you're going to end up with the same result. But the other reason is that the leadership, okay, this, the sorts of people who were 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 being listened to back then are the exact same sorts of people that are being listened to on television, right? I mean, they're still bringing Larry Summers out to talk, you know, and nobody asks him about Epstein, okay? But you, you see my point? Like it's they're just they just keep wheeling out the same completely discredited corrupt, cronyish people that they've been doing for decades. So there's no, it's the same thing with the Iraq war, right? There's, there's no consequences. The people that were cheerleading that war on are now resistance heroes to, to, you know, neoliberals. It's, it's, we're just recycling the worst, most wrong people that we have in our society into different leadership positions. So when you have a, when you have this situation and it's the same sort of thing with, with, you know, wall street investments, if you bail out people that made mistakes, right, Okay. And make them whole or, or help them regain their, their fortunes. Um, you're, you're not, you're not actually putting those assets into stronger hands, you know, and it's the same sort of thing with leadership. All of our, all of our leadership um, that, we, that we need to listen to, the people that are making decisions and advising, let's say, President Trump or President Obama, they're all the same wrong, clueless people we've had for decades. Um, so, so I have no, no faith um, that anything's going to get sustainably better until all of these people are gone. I, I'm okay. not saying you know, dead. I'm saying yeah, just yeah. completely irrelevant to the national dialogue and to what we're doing. We need an, we need an entirely new group of people and, and even on an individual level in communities just to step up and be able to be the voice of reason. The, the people that have been leading us, 
I mean, and it's even a wrong word to use because there's no, there's no, there's no leadership about these people are the most unwise people we have, right? The most corrupt people that we have in society. Um, but here's the good news. I think we have a ton of wise, smart, heroic, courageous, innovative talent in this country and in the world. We just need to be able to elevate those voices and those people um, to create the new world that I think we can create. But I think this is a transition point. So in other words, like once we get through this, this transition point, and it could take a few years, not just Corona, right? I mean, that's just domino number one. Uh, that's when I'm going to get so optimistic about our future. Could take a few years, but that's what needs to happen. We need a complete changing of the guard. Complete. So you're saying uh, you should you would be buying the dip here? <laughs> no. In, in uh, cultural terms? Uh, yeah, well, I would be trying to build what's coming, okay? So, like, I wrote a series, and I recommend um, anyone watching this check it out, on localism. And this is something that I'll be talking about more and more going forward. It's, it's about – I think it's a four or five, it's a four or five-part series. I don't think I wrote part five yet, maybe next week. But um, it's, it's just talking about how I think society, politics, culture – Everything should be structured. And it, and it just discusses the, the, this top-down, overly centralized approach that we have and we've, and we've come to embrace, where we're looking to Washington, D.C. for everything, where we say, oh, we just need to elect good people. Or, you know, oh, well, if 2020 doesn't work out, 2024 is going to work out. That's just like the slave mentality. The, the, the way we're going to get out of this is for, for as many people as possible— to look at themselves first and say, I can't change Washington, D.C., but I can change my mindset. I can change my behavior. I can be nicer to my wife. I can be nicer to my neighbors. I can be a better person. I can I can do stuff. OK, they're, they're, every single person can can control their attitude and their lives. And if and if enough people do that, the world will change. But but we're just we're just not there yet, unfortunately. But I think something like this. Um, and the and and as other dominoes fall from here on out, uh, could be the catalyst to to spark that um, movement in people. And I hope that's and I hope I can play a role in uh, inspiring people to think that way. Awesome, man. And so let me let me bring this back a little bit because obviously that's kind of where I, I want to end this conversation. But um, what does the coronavirus mean? You, you talked about the the domino effect, right? And how this is possibly the first domino and. I, you know, I might think that's arguable, but hey, whatever domino, first, second, third, whatever it is, it's certainly a big piece falling into place now. And wh what does it mean for or what you described as the everything bubble? And I mean, it's not just you; it's a lot of people here on Real Vision. And and, and what does it mean for the the fragility of financial markets? And is it, uh, uh, you know, a warning sign for the rest of our systems that this everything bubble popping could be, you know, a sign of more, you know, it could be the start of the start of the storm so to speak. Yeah, I mean, that, that's how I see it. And, and another thing just to, for, for, for listeners to check out, I wrote a, a series as well in 2018 called The Path to 2025, where I laid out that I thought the world would completely change from that point you know, on into 2025. Right, the, the, everything. I'm, and I'm talking like geopolitics, financial markets, economy, um, centralization versus decentralization. But virtually every single thing that we've we've known since we were born, you know, ab about how the world works. I believe almost all of those things will be completely turned on their head by around 2025. Um, I think that and that's sort of the, the window. So we're right in that window. Um, so if you think about, you know, the coronavirus as a domino. Well, think about um, one of the things I mentioned in the shaky foundation piece. Mm -hmm. Going into the coronavirus, we, we had built an equity bubble, another equity bubble. Um, we had a bond bubble that's bigger, that's even bigger than the equity bubble. Because, you know, as we were discussing long term trends, my entire life, again, my entire life has been a bondable market for sovereigns. OK, I mean, it was it was in the it was in the um, in the late 70s or early 80s where interest rates were at its highest and they've been coming down for 40 years. If you think about if you think about that in a lower interest rate environment for 40 years, when that reverses, everything reverses. 
Okay. Everything changes. You can't, you know, because all of the, so many of the behaviors, whether it's the military, whether it's the financial empire, or it's just your, 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 your average asset prices that are boosted, have been boosted for 40 years because of low interest rates. All of those things start to go into reverse or break down. Okay. So I'm, I'm seeing the coronavirus it's going to start creating pressure. I don't know if you saw this, but a lot of companies are now uh, drawing down revolvers. Um, they, they announced that yesterday. Um, so it's, you're starting to see. You're probably going to start to see liquidity tightening. And now you saw what the Fed announced today with I think what was it, 500 billion over or trillion dollars in repos. Um, the, the point is. It, it, Companies are going to start struggling. Individuals are going to start struggling. That's going to impact spending, but it's also going to impact credit. And credit, of course, as I just mentioned, is the biggest, most important market in the world. And credit and, and low interest rates have kept all of this, all of the behaviors, whether it's geopolitical or domestic consumption behaviors, it's underpinned all of it. So if that, again, if that trend is, is in the beginning stages of reversing, it's not, it, it, yes, there, there, you know, there's this blow up. And when you watch the stock market decline, you say, oh, you know, oh, wow, it's just, we're just going to be in this big blow up forever. It's not quite that. You have to look at it like we're, we're, we're at the, probably at the beginning of, of a multi-decade trend reversal. And the, the, the consequences of that are, um, you know, impossible to fully appreciate at this point. But you, what you, but what you can say is, if you have an empire and a domestic economy that's been built on a forty-year bond uh, or interest rate bull market, uh, if that ends, everything, everything about the way the world is constructed will end. Yeah, I mean, at the editorial team here in Real Vision, we have a, a Slack channel that has been screaming about you know, cruise line credit and and you know. Um, even casinos and, and every everything every section of the credit market seems to be at least feeling that pressure that liquidity pressure that, that you just talked about and um, in that in that you know let's talk about the oil industry for a little bit because you were a uh, an oil analyst at Lehman and or under the oil analyst at Lehman or whatever you want to call it what do you see going on there I mean obviously there's a lot of things blowing up the Saudis you know you know, are targeting somebody, probably the Russians, maybe somebody else, maybe us. What, what, what's going on there? Yeah. So, OK, the, now that's interesting. I don't follow the oil markets very closely at all anymore. But when I saw, you know, the reports of how um, OPEC plus Russia uh, had a meeting and they were trying to get together on some production cuts and, and you know, the Russian representative basically was like, no, we're, you know, we're not doing it. Enough's enough. Um, that really um, made my hair stand up because that to me, right? I mean, the the narrative that's been out there forever is that Russia needs oil prices higher, and if Russia doesn't, I do. If you recall back in like 2015 or so, every single financial publication was saying, "Oh, Putin's gone. You know, Russia's dead. The economy. Look at the ruble. It's over for them. They can't handle these low oil prices." Well. You know, two years later, we're told that Putin's the mastermind that you know got Donald Trump elected. So I guess that didn't work out. But the point is this: you know, whereas the U.S. is 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 very fragile, I think a country like Russia is much more anti-fragile than the U.S. right now because they've been battered so badly. Right? They, the USSR already collapsed. You know, they've been through that sort of collapse already. The society has been through that. Um, and so what I what I what I'm and this is pure speculation, but it's something that's gone through my head. You know, did, did, is Putin? Did Putin look at the situation and say, "Okay, we're going to make a power play move here"? You know, we're 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 okay with this. We're going to handle this. We're going to we're going to put pressure on the societies that are more fragile than we are, and let's see how you deal with it. Um, I, I sort of see the, the move in that sort of geopolitical context. Um, again, I could be wrong about that because I, I don't pay that much attention to this anymore. But I will say this: I think you're going to see more moves like that. Um, going forward, where countries that have been pushing for multipolarity, such as China and Russia, for for a for less of a U.S. U.S. hegemony, will mm -hmm. start making moves to weaken um, the U.S. position globally when they when they have an opportunity. And th and I think they're seeing this as an opportunity. I mean, it sucks to say that, but I think that's that's just how the world works. And another example of this would be. I don't know if you're following it, but China is now aggressively um, sending supplies as well as personnel to Italy. 
as they're going through this. Okay, so so that's a that's a move. Now, now, you know, is, is China doing this out of altruistic reasons? No chance. What are they doing? They're trying to look good. Because because they know that the U.S. looks terrible right now because of how this has been handled. And so China is going to say, hey, no one's helping Italy. Your, your own neighbors aren't going to help you. The U.S. can't even, you know what I mean, make test kits. Here you go. Here are some ventilators. Here's some plasma. So I think I think one of the things that people aren't appreciating about coronavirus is it's very likely to be a domino that starts that acceleration of the decline of U.S. hegemony globally. Um, it's shit. I could have never thought of it. I've written a lot about how I think by 2025, the world will be fully multipolar. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think I think this is going to be a catalyst that leads to the United States' dominant position right, in the world being reduced. Now, how far reduced? I don't know. OK, that 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 remains completely unknown. But if you're talking about a country that's basically been able to tell the entire planet since, I don't know, since World War Two or, or let's say since the collapse of the USSR, um, what to do at almost any given moment um, and everyone has to listen, those days are now over. And I think coronavirus is going to be an, an event that accelerates that reality that a lot of people have been fighting. But again, this is something that I've also written about. It's not a bad thing, okay? Empire has been terrible for the average American, horrible for us. It's not good. It, it creates a, a surveillance state at home. It, it funnels money to the worst people in the worst industries. It encourages financial scams, engineering, war. OK, we've completely neglected our own country because we're so focused. All of our energy and all of our money is focused on dominating the rest of the world so that a few oligarchs can get a power trip and make more money. It's been terrible for the average American. So if 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 we're if we're like, let's say, post 2025 or even now, you know, this country can marshal its its, its talent and, and actually make things and actually create things and actually innovate and focus on our communities and our states and what's going on within our borders as opposed to trying to control people in Afghanistan and Iraq, we're going to be in great shape. We're going to, everyone's going to be a lot happier after we get through a tough period. So don't, if, if you're attached, right, if you're psychologically attached to the empire, thinking it gives you some sort of power or pride or anything like that, you should you should let that go because it's not good for you. On the flip side, though, we also don't want to be dominated by another empire. So we, we also need to be careful that, you know, you don't want another hegemon, right? You don't want China to all of a sudden be bossing around, you know, the, the U.S. The entire world, yeah. So, so, it's a, so it's a balance. But but I think, you know, this is what I've, I've been saying for a long time. We want national defense, not national offense. We've been focused on national offense, which is what empires do. We need to be focused on national defense, which is making sure that we can be a sovereign country and we can be a strong country. But that means focusing on our stuff, okay? We have tons of resources. We have tons of talent. We still have a constitution. We still have a legacy of freedom and entrepreneurship. There's so much talent in this country, and it's 99% of it's been wasted by empire. So don't, you know, lament necessarily what's happening. We just don't want to go too far in the other direction, right? We 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 don't want to be a weak, collapsed country that other countries take advantage of. OK, so you don't want the pendulum to swing too far, but you but the, but the pendulum's been all the way over here with this crazy oligarchic empire. So we need to bring it right over here. We don't want to bring it over there. Right here in the middle. Sanity, you know, equilibrium. That's what I hope. OK, so I have a few more questions for you. Uh, but naturally, what I just thought there, we, we kind of started this conversation talking about uh more of the, the hegemony of the dollar rather than the hegemony of the United States military. What do you – I mean, obviously, it's going to take a lot of economic and financial changes for the United States dollar to not be the world reserve currency anymore. Do you think coronavirus is is the first domino in, in actually changing that? And, and if so, where do you see this – what is the natural progression of that if this actually is you know, the first step in, in – changing of the guard, so to speak. What, what is it going to be replaced by? Excuse me. Sure, sure. So, so this is something that I have been writing about for a very long time. And what I – there's a few things. So the writing has been on the wall for a while, especially since Trump came in. But this has been going on for, for quite some time anyway. The U.S. dollar has been more weaponized. 
Okay, you've seen that with Iran and even with Europe threatening them that you know you're going to be cut off from the banking system, U.S. banking system. If you let's say threatening Europe that if they trade with Iran, companies could be could be taken away from the U.S. financial system. So it's been this huge stick. And so if the when the global reserve currency becomes that politicized, I mean, it's always been politicized, but when it becomes become, becomes clearly, overtly and explicitly the primary weapon of empire um, just to beat people over the head, uh, that's a, a problem of such enormous magnitude that there will be a solution. So my 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 uh, my I'm not here trying to say I know what how it's going to play out because I definitely don't. But I do know when you have a problem this big and you have actors motivated to solve it in some way that it will be solved in some way. My base case is that the world sort of bifurcates a little bit. Um, and, you know, let's say, you know, you, you have like a multi in a multipolar world, you may have certain blocks, you know, and they use a certain currency. And then the U.S. and maybe its allies and blocks use a different kind of currency. And maybe it's the dollar. And, you know, and, and there's sort of these separate parallel systems with different dominant currencies. That's one option. Um, you know, we there are there are other things that we've seen out there, you know, like could could gold be used as settlement for, you know, big international transactions? I don't know. Um, could Bitcoin? It could be. Uh, it's tough to say. I mean, the, the the bigger the bigger point here is that when you have a problem that's this big, there a solution will be figured out, and 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 so that's and that's so that's more my view. Now, what do I hope? I hope that whatever the solution is, it's some sort of politically neutral. Um, currency that that the world sort of just naturally organically comes to. I I'd, I'd prefer it not to be a top down thing. I'd I'd sort of hope it's just something that's you know like not that it will be these things, but I'm saying like that has the qualities of gold or of Bitcoin, right? Which is that nobody can nobody controls them. They're just they're just these neutral things um, that you can take from one place to the other. It's your it's your asset. Nobody else's liability. That's the sort of thing you need because the moment it's 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 controlled by a body of people, even if it's on an international level um, or a country, it's not really a neutral global currency. And so that that that's what I hope. Um, I don't want to see in my lifetime, and I hope we never see it again, a uh, country, any country controlling the global reserve currency. I, I think that's that should be the biggest lesson of uh, the last 40 years, that, that, if a, that if a country controls the world currency, full, totally controls the global reserve currency, um, fiat currency, right, they control the world, period. I mean, there's no, you know, you control the financial system, you control the entire planet. And so the whole planet will be under the empire of whatever country controls the reserve currency. So I hope that we're smart enough to never let this sort of a situation happen again, where one country is running um, the currency for the for the planet. It's a, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I actually I agree. I mean, you're the expert here, but I mean, everything that you just said makes perfect sense to me. And maybe it ends up actually being a combination of uh, gold and Bitcoin, or maybe it's something totally new. But right. in between here and there. Um, how do individuals stay afloat through the turbulence? And, you know, why do we have to embrace change in, in, in times like this? Or, or what is the risk of not embracing change? Right. So it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. And this, this is what really makes me a little bit, you know, sad, um, you know, over the, over the coming, let's say, months or, or even years, is that uh, we already have a situation with the bottom half of the population in the U.S. is is so stretched, and this is what I wrote about my financial feudalism um, piece. You know that that they that they've taken on so much debt just to survive, um, to try to buy housing. Like so, for example, one of the big problems is. Um, 40 years ago or so, you could, the, if you look at the ratio, two important ratios, the ratio of income, let's say real median income to housing prices or real median income to uh, a college degree, you know, those things were attainable, okay, for people without, without taking on an enormous amount of, of debt. And then still barely, you know, being able to make your mortgage payments. It was an attainable thing. And we were, as I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of a huge asset boom. So the, the, you had all these generations that were able to buy all these things at a reasonable valuations, and we were in the beginning of an asset boom. Now we're at the end of, right, this most likely at the end of this 40-year um, debt bubble, 
And uh, and asset prices may not increase like that going forward. I mean, they probably won't. And so, you know, what what what's going to happen to young people? I mean, what's going to happen to young people with a ton of debt um, that can't afford a house now? They're not having children because because of that insecurity. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I really I, I understand as much as I you know disagree with um, the actual policies, a lot of the policies of Sanders, I understand his supporters. I understand why they're gravitating to that, because it's this desperation. I mean, if I were 30, looking to start a family, and I wasn't, you know, in, in a fortunate position I'm in, you know, and I had a lot of debt, and, and I'm looking at my the, the future, I'm thinking, this is extremely bleak. What what's So I don't know how we're going to help that. I don't, I don't know how, how that gets worked out. It could get worked out by gigantic deflation, I suppose. Um, but I don't know if that's the right solution. So I don't know. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, I'm, it's still too early to know how, how this is going to help out. But we really need to be thinking about the fact that an entire generation isn't having, isn't forming families and is completely indebted. And, and so we're just so far gone. We've lost compassion, empathy. Um, we're not thinking about our fellow people at all in this crazed pursuit of like asset bubbles and power. Um, we just need a complete um, revival. You know, we need, we need a, we need an ethical revolution. That's the, that's the real, a consciousness revolution. I mean, if there's one revolution, you know, I want to really see it's that. And that, as, as I was mentioning earlier with the individual, like what an individual, it starts with you, you know, it starts with your mind, it starts with your, with your consciousness, all of us, because right now we're an extremely unconscious, unethical, immoral people, quite frankly, yeah. as a whole. Yeah. And particularly um, the people in leadership positions, the people with, with, with the resources. And I've been very frustrated, you know, because I had, uh, you know, I was in a job that paid very well. I'm also come from a, you know, a privileged background. You know, I've, I've, I've had things pretty easy compared to a lot of other people. And so I've seen it as my sort of duty to, to make, speak out and try to do what I can. But what I notice is 99% of my socioeconomic class does nothing of that. You know, they're, they're just completely obsessed with this tunnel vision of getting more and being being richer. And um, there's nothing wrong with wanting nice things and, and, and being successful. But but to just completely be OK with the hollowing out and predatory nature of our society and culture to our fellow people to just not care at all is uh, is horrible. And I hope we change. Well, I mean, I don't want to leave it on, on that dark of a note, but um, we, we're actually change. running out of time here. We could we could change, and that's positive. That's a beautiful thing about it. Is is it's really the decision is up to each and every one of us. Yeah. And so, uh, with that, uh, we're going to leave you. I mean, I could talk to you for another five hours. I, this is such a pleasure for me, um, despite the you know <laughs> dark topics we kind of touched on. But uh, if you want to learn more from Mike check it out from libertyblitzkrieg.com. Obviously, we're going to have you know more and more interviews like this. So hopefully we can get you the best information as soon as possible. And uh, for Real Vision, I'm Drew Bissett. Thanks for joining us. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.